Bible study and prayer meeting, and we're glad to welcome you in the Saviour's name to our internet listeners, those that tune in, uh, wherever you are, on holiday or at home or at work even, and uh, uh, wherever you're found, even in the car tonight and you're listening uh, audio, uh, we trust the Lord will bless you and encourage you through the preaching of his holy word. And then as we gather for prayer, may the Lord encourage us, give to us the spirit of true and believing prayer. We're going to stand together as we worship. We're singing that great hymn, uh, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, Tune My Heart to Sing Thy Grace. We'll stand as we worship after the key place. Let's just take a few moments and we'll bow briefly in prayer before the Lord. Our gracious and our eternal loving Heavenly Father, it is with thanksgiving and praise that we're found once again in thy presence, in thy courts, in thy house. It is with joy that we can enter into heaven itself and worship thee. We come, Lord, the living to praise thee. We thank thee that thou art God and thou art God alone. We come to worship thee in the trinity of thy sacred persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To thee, God the Father, who planned our salvation in eternity past. To thee, God the Son, who purchased that salvation for us at the place called Calvary. To thee, God the Holy Spirit, who presented that salvation to us in time. We come to worship thee, the God of all creation, the God of revelation, and the God of our salvation. And we bow the knee, Lord, and humble our hearts, and, and Lord, praise, and, and we seek to exalt and honor and glorify, and Lord, even eulogize thy holy name. We can say with the psalmist, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. And Lord, we come to praise thee. We come to give thee thanks, Lord, for who thou art and all that thou hast done for us. We thank thee, Lord, for the temporal blessings of this life. We enjoy, Lord, food and clothing. We have warmth and shelter. We have that measure of health and strength, the use of all of our faculties, the several abilities, the gifts and talents bestowed upon us. We thank thee, Lord, for the mercies of God seen and those mercies that are unseen, just as the iceberg is one-tenth seen, nine-tenths under and submerged under the water. We don't see it. So we believe, Lord, that only one-tenth of all that God is doing for us, if we could even measure it in that way, and we would never want to dishonor thee. Lord, nine-tenths is often unseen. 
so much you're doing for us. Lord, you're providing for us. You're sending holy angels to defend us against the onslaughts of the wicked. You're directing our path. You're planning our future. Lord, you're guiding. You're providing. Lord, you're giving us grace. You're keeping us on the straight and narrow path. Lord, you're being good to us. You're thinking upon us. Even the psalmist says, thy thoughts to us, Lord, cannot be numbered. And if we were to reckon them, they're more than the sand on the seashore. We realize, Lord, we couldn't number the stars. We couldn't number the little grains of sand, that, Lord, that's on this earth. Uh, we couldn't no number, Lord, even the dust cells around us. We couldn't even number hardly, Lord, the uh, population of heaven and of earth. But yet, Lord, we recognize and we bless thee that thou art a God who knows us through and through. You know our DNA from the moment, O God, of conception in the womb. We thank thee, Lord, that our frame was known to thee and thou didst, Lord, observe our form inside the very womb. You brought us into this world as living souls. Lord, you know our down sitting and uprising and our thoughts are far off. Our Saviour said, your heavenly Father knoweth what ye have need of. And here we are, Lord, standing in need of the Lord. We pray for thy presence and blessing. We pray that for a, a a spirit of thankfulness and praise and gratitude among us. We ask, O oh God, that we will, as we were singing in this great hymn, we will remember that those streams of mercy, uh, ever flowing, Lord, call for songs of loudest praise. And we desire, Lord, to give thee the honor and the glory and to love thee tonight with all our heart. We ask, Lord, for help tonight. We realize, O oh God, you've been our help in ages past, our strength even for those years that were to come. And now here we are again standing in need of thee, Lord. There's collective need and there's individual need. This meeting, O oh God, stands in, Lord, bankruptcy and Lord, poverty without thee, and we pray you'll step in and come and meet with us and gather us around thy feet and around thy word and then around thy throne. Lord, we pray that we might be like Mary, who chose that good part that shall not be taken away from her, and she sat at thy feet to hear the word from thy mouth. And Lord, you give her counsel, and you instructed her from the mouth of the Lord. And we pray that we might choose that good part tonight as we have come to thy house, as we've entered into thy presence by faith on the ground of the shed blood. We stand, O God, in the righteousness of Christ, and we thank thee, Lord, and praise thee for past blessings. Be with us now. Take of our thanks for saving our souls. Thank you for our English Bible and civil and religious liberty. We thank thee for the spiritual blessings we enjoy in our union and salvation and redemption in Christ. We thank thee we are seated in heavenly places with him. We are, Lord, those who are children of the King. We bless thee, Lord. We have eternal life. We are possessors of that life, and we enjoy it now, and we shall enjoy it forever. We thank thee we'll never perish, we'll never be in hell. We have an inheritance that's reserved for us in heaven. And even until then, Lord, we are kept by the power of God unto salvation. Never will we perish in hell. Never will we die in our sin. Lord, it'll never be said of thy children redeemed by blood. Where Jesus is, you'll never be. We thank thee, Lord, that heaven is our eternal home, and the best is yet to be. Praise thy holy name. We thank thee, Lord, for uh, mercy seen spiritually and unseen and how good is the God we adore and Lord we would seek to counter many blessings and name them one by one and it will surprise us what the Lord has done and we believe Lord there's so much more you will do and we ask that you'll help us tonight and you'll be with us here in the prayer house and you'll gather us Lord around thy throne there we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need so we commit ourselves now to thee we think of many others who are gathering in a like fashion as us and some O oh God may be smaller in number discouraged in heart some may even meet tonight Lord and only one or two but some may even meet Lord and there'll not even be a single person to join with them we pray Lord you will encourage thy people and some are laboring between a rock and a hard place and Lord some are certainly Lord down and discouraged in heart and we pray for lifting up we pray for a little reviving in their bondage and grant O oh God you will give us the same in ours and you'll do us all good tonight so Lord as we have gathered as we have come perhaps from a busy schedule today and Lord as many commitments are upon us when 
And Lord, we gather even on a, a Tuesday evening, Lord, and maybe the burden of the day and, and the care of this world is weighing heavily upon us. Maybe other things are pressing, demanding attention, niggling at us, Lord, causing us vexation of spirit and anxiety of mind. We just speak the word into our heart tonight. Just speak, Lord, to our souls. Just settle us down, calm our spirit, and grant, Lord, that we will be still and know that thou art God and you're in control. Nothing's happening by chance. All is designed by a God of love and a Savior who cares and the Holy Spirit who's directing the Comforter. So hear our prayer tonight and enrich us with a sense of thy presence. Bless the word to our heart. Prepare our souls, Lord, and grant, Lord, even now, just this very moment, Lord, even though we perhaps have rushed in from a busy day, that we'll just have this little time alone with thee and spent before thy throne, that it's not wasted. It's no vain thing to wait on thee. May we renew the strength. May we be encouraged. And as iron would sharpen iron, so may we build up one another's countenance. Help us as we would come to the season of prayer. Lord, we're not unmindful of our own infirmities and our own weaknesses. And Lord, our own lack of desire and burden of heart at times. But we pray, whether audibly or silently, that we will do business with heaven tonight. And heaven will come down our souls to greet and glory crying for us the mercy seat. So prepare our hearts. Cleanse us afresh in the blood of the Lamb. Forgive us, Lord, for waywardness and backsliding. Forgive us for lack of love for thee and our fellow man. Forgive us, Lord, for sinning and grieving thy Holy Spirit. And grant to us now cleansing and washing and healing through the blood. And give to us the infilling of the Holy Spirit of promise. Loving Father, in answer now to prayer as we come to read the word and preach the message you've given to us. Grant to me thy servant and these thy people the hearing ear the understanding heart and mind and give to me that anointing and that infilling of the Holy Spirit of God with wisdom and power that I might rightly divide and handle the word of life and Father in answer to prayer as we leave the house later on in the divine will may we go with a spring in our step with joy in our soul knowing it was good for us to be here and Lord we will be careful to give all the honour praise and glory to thee the thrice holy Jehovah God of heaven and earth. And we ask these things and offer our prayer in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the people of God said, Amen and Amen. Let's turn in our Bibles, please, to Luke's Gospel, chapter 19. Luke, chapter 19. We're going to... Read a few verses from Luke chapter 19 and break into the chapter at verse 37. Luke chapter 19, verse 37. And let's hear the word of the Lord. And when Jesus was come nigh, even nigh at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And Jesus answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Amen. We'll end our reading there. Uh, at verse 40, we know the Lord will indeed bless the public and brief reading of his word to all of our hearts. We have in these verses, uh, as I mentioned before in another chapter, Mark chapter 11, Christ's triumphant entry into the city of Jerusalem. The king had come into their midst and multitudes welcomed him on that occasion. Now, it is sad to read that later on, that same multitude were gathered in Jerusalem and they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. But on this occasion, their performance certainly was good because they extolled him, they eulogized him. And they said, blessed be the king. Another occasion, they said, blessed be the son of David who cometh in the name of the Lord. They were quoting directly from the 118th Psalm. It was a direct quotation and they saw Christ coming into Jerusalem as the fulfillment of that prophecy that they had learned from their uh, mother's knee, so to speak. And they realized, but their view of Christ's coming and kingdom was uh, a misunderstanding 
uh, that the kingdom of heaven was not physical, it wasn't temporal upon the earth. Rather, the kingdom of heaven was spiritual, and he was a spiritual king over a spiritual kingdom, and he wasn't going to sit upon the throne of David physically, and he wasn't going to put the Roman uh, occupational force out of Israel, and he wasn't going to deal with all the enemies around, the great enemy, the sin and the devil. Uh, were the enemies of Christ's kingdom and he was come to set prisoners free and to deliver. And some of them did recognize that whenever they quoted the psalm, Hosanna, save now, save now, Hosanna to God in the highest. But up until this juncture, many of these folks have been following the Lord. They had traveled from all parts of Israel to gather at Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. And alongside that, they knew that Christ was making his way to Jerusalem. And they wanted to be there for what they would call the triumphal entrance into the city. The palm trees on the ground and their clothes strewn over the uh, coat of the ass as the Lord, their king, according to the prophecy of Zechariah, would come riding on the colt of an ass or the foal of a donkey. And he would enter into Jerusalem and then the cry would come, behold, your king. That would be a fulfillment. And they would have known the Holy Scriptures of the prophecy of Zechariah and also of Psalm 118. So there was excitement as the Savior entered in. Because remember, these are the people, the same people that had seen the Lord heal the sick and raise the dead. They had witnessed some of their own family members and some of their friends. And by the way, some of those who were healed would have been present in Jerusalem to give glory to God that Christ the Messiah had come at last. He had given sight to the blind. He had given hearing to the deaf. He had comforted all who mourned. And he had given rest to those who labored under the heavy weight of sin and were heavy laden under the judgment and wrath of God. So truly, this multitude, if none other upon God's earth, had much to be thankful for. This multitude, out of all that were on planet earth in the days of our Lord, had more to give thanks to God for than any other people. And we have to say this, they are to be commended on this occasion, at least, because they did give praise and honour and glory to God. And if like the inhabitants of Jerusalem at that time, if we too reflect upon the goodness and mercy and grace of our God, we will have good reason to rejoice like them and to praise the Lord for the great things that he has done for us. We too can raise our Ebenezer and say hitherto, hath the Lord helped us. And I have always felt over the years that the spirit of ingratitude is what robs us of God's greatest blessings. That unthankful heart at times is what really steals away the great blessings that God has in store for us. I've always felt it's a timely reminder to say to the people of God, of all the people on this earth, that we have more to be thankful for than any other person on God's created earth. Now looking at this passage in Luke chapter 19, I believe it will furnish us with some thoughts uh, regarding the, the theme, the spirit of thankfulness and praise to God. From the passage then, as we have a little prayer talk, I want you to notice first of all the character of their praise. If you notice with me in the verse 37, uh, the Lord actually gives us the very character or nature of this spirit of thankfulness and praise that was found in the hearts of these disciples. Notice what it says there in verse 37. When Jesus was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. Now, every word in Scripture is important. And the words that the Holy Ghost uses are significant. In other words, what the Lord has done here, he has in a single verse or phrase, he has outlined the nature of true biblical praise and thanksgiving. You'll notice that their praise was instant. Verse 37, if you look at it closely, their praise was instant. The Bible says that he was descending from the Mount of Olives 
And they saw him coming down from the Mount of Olives and they began to gather right away. And then the moment the Lord touched his feet upon the soil in Jerusalem, that very moment he got onto that fold and rode into that city and then stepped onto Jerusalem soil. The Bible says they began. They started right away to bring glory and honor to Christ. And their praise was instant. In other words, these disciples didn't wait to see what would happen. They didn't wait to see if Christ would sit on the throne of David, declare himself to be Israel's rightful king, and establish the kingdom under the rulership of God's Messiah. They didn't wait Maybe some felt they should. The, the Pharisees certainly didn't want this praise given to Christ. I want to tell you that they didn't wait until things settled for a little season and then we'll see how things go. Rather, the moment they saw Christ descending from the Mount of Olives, that very precise moment, they began to sing with a loud voice the praises of the Lord. They were singing from Psalm 118, if not singing that section literally singing it and chanting it as the Lord was riding into the city of Jerusalem. And they also said that they were praising him for the mighty works that he had done. There was no delay in singing Christ's praise. They responded well on this occasion to the public opportunity given to them to sing the praises of the Lord. You know, it's good if we too have a very quick response to even the slightest perception of God's mercies in Christ to our undeserving souls. I want to say to you tonight that you and I quite often have so much to be thankful for, but we could miss it. And there's many a time when I feel God has answered prayer for me, and the next day when I reflected upon it, I realized that I'd been slow very, very slow and remiss in returning again to give thanks. I felt I was among the nine lepers who never returned except the one to give glory to God. See it, Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher we often quote, he said this, I quote, I am certain that the church in these days has lost much by not being thankful for little. It is true that ingratitude it was the sin of Israel in the past. And it is true that even at present, ingratitude could be the besetting sin of the church today. The disciples on this occasion were quick to recognize an opportunity for gratitude. Here was an opportunity publicly to bless the name of the Lord, to sing forth his praise, to acknowledge his goodness and his mighty works, and to publicly give thanks and give glory to God. For the moment Christ set foot on Jerusalem soil, their hearts were ablaze with the spirit and song of praise. They were to be commended for a good performance, at least on this occasion. And you know what is true? If we would sing often of Christ's love and mercy, I believe we would soon have much more to sing about. Streams of mercy never ceasing. We were singing that. Call for songs of loudest praise. So often God's favours, God's mercy, God's goodness and grace to us, it lies on the ground of ingratitude. It just lies forgotten on the ground of ingratitude. Let's make our praise instant. Let's make it loud and glorious because he's worthy of it. And the slightest perception of God's goodness to you and God's mercy to me should be acknowledged right away and the glory be given to him. We would never want to be remiss nor have the spirit of ingratitude. No doubt it will be a sign of the end times. And what's generally in the world is mirrored in the church. What you see on the outside generally creeps into the inside of the church. What the world's doing oft times comes into the church and we know that one of the marks of the end time will be a spirit of thanklessness. And that will creep into the church. It most certainly will. But you know, we've got to remember, the Lord has done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Their praise was not only instant, 
But you notice their praise was collective. In verse 37, it says the whole multitude. If you notice there in your, your Bible, the whole multitude began. There wasn't a silent tongue among the body of these believers. They joined together in the song of praise to the Lord. No doubt that some of these disciples, they had their problems. And I know it's sanctified imagination to one degree. But I'm sure that some of those present in Jerusalem, they weren't without their difficulties. I don't know, but I would imagine there's among that multitude and there was a, a massive crowd. There's got to be a man or a woman. And maybe they have a sick wife and a sick child. Or even their grandparents are going through some terrible illness and they haven't been healed. Christ didn't heal everyone in Jerusalem, but he healed, healed multitudes. There's no doubt about that. Maybe he had some, and they were present that day, and they would have wayward children. They didn't have their children with them in the Lord. Their children were wild, rebellious, and away in the far country. Their hearts were broken, but they were in Jerusalem. And yet they joined in with the praise. There's no doubt that there was maybe someone there, and they had a loved one that was lost that had no time for even the Jewish religion and just seemed to be ungodly, a, a pagan, a heathen, an atheist, even in among a family of believers. And their hearts would have been broken. No doubt there had been some there, and maybe a few days previous, for all we know, they had buried a loved one. And yet they were among this multitude, and they were joining in the praise. And maybe they had reason not to praise. Maybe they could have even justified why they weren't singing, why they weren't quoting Psalm 118, why they weren't thinking of Zechariah's prophecy, why they weren't focused upon the mighty works of God that Christ had done. But I want to tell you that there may have been even some who were poor and they hadn't a single shekel. And maybe they hadn't eaten for a few days. Maybe they were hoping to meet some friends who might give them some food. Or they may even, even in Jerusalem with a large crowd and all the travelers, they may even be begging because it was a time for generosity, the feast of the Passover, a time for thanksgiving, praise, and, and giving, even in helping others. There may have been some who there, I believe, who, as you would believe, they were men and women of like passions as we are. They had their ups and they had their downs. There's no doubt there were some among that multitude and the Lord had healed them. I'm sure there were lepers there who maybe a month earlier were leprosy and were outcasts, but they were there to sing the Lord's praise. Maybe someone who was blind had to be led into the city or the town or the little village to beg. And there they are among the multitude. There wasn't a silent tongue. In other words, none were excluded on any grounds that we have just mentioned on other grounds as well. They didn't even exclude themselves. They didn't say, well, I don't feel like giving praise to God. I don't feel like honoring the Lord. Now, some of us may not feel like singing or praising God. That's true. But when we do begin, we soon discover that we have good reason to praise him. Let Christ and his person and his work Tune your harp tonight. Let it tighten the strings of your soul tonight that you may sing his praise. You may honor him and you will sing and make melody in your heart. It was not only instant praise, it was collective praise. And we want to be able to say tonight, praise him. Praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. You notice their praise also in the character of it. It was wholehearted. Look at verse 37 again. It says, with a loud voice. In other words, they didn't hold back. Every effort went into praising Christ. As I mentioned earlier, these streams of mercy, the mighty works Christ had done in their midst. It calls now for the songs of loudest praise. You're not to hold back. Now, I know sometimes we are more conservative. And we don't want to be thought of as Pentecostal. We don't want to be thought of as or viewed as apostasy in the free church because we're going charismatic. We've often heard uh, criticism 
uh, from others as well to see the free church is getting charismatic now because we had a choir at the front for men and women from the church and we had young people on the youth day playing instruments and people criticize that way but I want to tell you something sometimes and I'm not advocating in any way Pentecostal activity some of it we could borrow other words we couldn't touch with a barge pole but I will say this that sometimes in our being conservative and holding back that spirit of thanksgiving and praise is lost and there has to be a public display of praise you could say well I just praise the Lord within my own heart well that's true but here it was collective here it was wholehearted and the Bible says they did it with a loud voice so it was heard and as I mentioned that this mighty works the Lord had done they called for songs of loudest praise we've got to make his praise glorious what did the psalmist say and it's as much scripture as the New Testament is the Bible is one book bless the Lord O my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name bless the Lord O my soul and forget not all his benefits bless the Lord and then the psalmist went on to enumerate those those blessings and benefits I'm not going to get into them tonight uh, but you have read the Psalm 103 read it again and you'll see the benefits that he was talking about furthermore would it be right to whisper Christ's praise I don't think so it wouldn't be just to say to someone beside you praise the Lord no I, I believe it has to be with wholeheartedness in other words, would it be honouring to Christ if we held back in our singing, if we held back in our praise of the Lord in prayer, if we were afraid to say an amen to someone who said something that blessed your soul, or to say glory or hallelujah, praise the Lord, because someone was praying it's scriptural? You know, does Christ not deserve our loudest songs? I think he does. Of course he does. Does he not Demand our best voice? Of course he does. Does he not look for wholehearted worship and praise of his thrice holy name? The hymn writer penned these beautiful words we often sing. And when I think that God his son not sparing sent him to die, I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul. It was that thought of Christ and what he had done for the hymn writer's soul that they penned these words. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul. And it comes after when I think that God his son not sparing sent him to die. I scarce can take it in. Then sings my soul. My Savior God to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. Let us make his praise glorious. You have the character of their praise here in this passage. You also have secondly the content of their praise. If you notice with me there in verse 38 what it says. I know we have it in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John on this occasion, all four Gospels, uh, do make reference to this entrance into Jerusalem. But in verse 38, we read these words saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Elsewhere we have, Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna to the King of Israel. Hosanna. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of of the Lord. So that's the, the praise, that's the content of it. No song on earth or even in heaven is so sweet as that which has its theme, the person and the work of Christ. In the world, they have their songs, they have their anthems, they have their melodies, they have their harmonies, they have their beat, they have their words. They have their sentimentality. They have their tears when they hear a certain song. And then a collective group, football, or some other group, they begin to sing. And as they sing, they're moved, and they're emotional, and they cry. But I tell you this, 
There's no song on earth or in heaven that has a greater theme and a more joyful tune than the child of God singing about the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to tell you that his sorrow and suffering, his pain and his punishment, his terror and his torment as your substitute is the melody of our song and it is the theme of our praise. The center of their praise was Christ, the Son of the living God, the Lord himself in the person of Christ. His work of salvation, save now, bring salvation now. That's what they said. And that work that he came to accomplish upon the cross. You know, this song that is before us, it has to do with the worthiness of Christ. Notice what it says there in verse 38. Blessed be the king, or blessed be him that cometh in the name of the Lord. On this occasion, they recognized him as the king, the king of Israel, the king of the Jews, and he is king of kings and lord of lords. Blessed, it's an interesting word because we know the word in the English, it's the word eulogy. And if you see that word blessed there in your New Testament, you will know that that's uh, what we have in our English equivalent, it's the word eulogy. It means to eulogize, bless. So when you're exhorted in Scripture to bless the Lord, you're eulogizing. That is, you're extolling, you're exalting. That's why sometimes we say, oh Lord, we just bless you. And that means that we just lift you up, we eulogize you, and we honor you, and we give you thanks and praise, and we glorify your name. And that's why we are reluctant to give eulogies to our fellow man. They belong to the Lord. He's the one to be blessed and not mankind. But it is interesting, that little word, blessed. That means eulogize. Or in other words, praise, exalt, lift up, honor an individual. Lift up because this individual is worthy. This individual is honorable. That's exactly what that means. Now, when it's used of Christ, when it's used properly of Christ, it refers to his unique person. We extol him because he is God veiled in human flesh. We eulogize him because he is Jehovah Jesus. He's the creator of the ends of the earth. Veiled in our human flesh, Bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh is Elohim, the creator of the universe. And how can you put divinity into humanity? Well, God did that in the person of his son. And the Lord Jesus, and I've watched a few videos recently of Muslims and the Islamic religion challenging so-called Christians, taking even God's word, the Bible, and saying Jesus nowhere said he was God. And denying the deity of Christ. And yet even in this very passage. The very words they used. That means eulogize, worship, extol, magnify. And we could prove from scripture the deity of Christ. But I want to tell you this. When it's used of Christ. It's used of his unique person. That he is two distinct natures God and man in one unique person there is a poem I don't have it with me but it's called the incomparable Christ if you get a chance even on the internet or even get it printed out before you come to a season of prayer you take that poem the incomparable Christ and you read it before the Lord I tell you it will change your prayer life and your prayer time the incomparable Christ. Maybe a lengthy poem, but it's a tremendous presentation of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. He's the mediator between God and men. He's the only Savior for sinners. He's the Redeemer of God's elect and the Savior of the world. Therefore, he is worthy of all honor and he's worthy of all praise. There is a little hymn in our hymn book I don't think we have sung it here in the church. We may do so because it does go to the common meter, so we will get a tune for it. 
And uh, we know, well, not number four, it's number 69, but I'm going to read you number four because we have sung this, and it's all for a thousand tongues to sing. My great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of his grace. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honours of his name. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrow cease. Tis music in the sinner's ear, tis life and health and peace. Glory to God and praise and love be ever, ever given by saints below and saints above the church in earth and heaven. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. It's true that a single tongue wouldn't even be enough. And even if you had a thousand tongues and a thousand voices, it still wouldn't be enough to sing the worthiness of Christ. And there's the theme of your praise. And you cannot, neither can I, say tonight that we have nothing to give God praise for. The worthiness, the very content of their praise was this. The worthiness of Christ. It not only had to do with the worthiness of Christ, but it had to do with the work of Christ. I said to you in Matthew, in Mark, and in John's gospel, the word Hosanna is used. Why Luke has left it out, we do not know. But there's no mistake. But the other writers of the gospel, they brought in Psalm 118, verses 22 through 26. I want to read that to you. If you have your Bible, you can take it as well, for it is important that we read this tonight. It's Psalm 118, verse 15, or 118, verse 22. And here we read the stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. I do want to say something to you uh, that John Douglas was over, Dr. John Douglas was over in Israel, and he got speaking to uh, an Israel guide. And he was a Jew, but he wasn't saved. And he certainly was into his religion. And he brought him to this passage. And he said these words to him because he taught Hebrew in the college and he knew biblical Hebrew and ancient Hebrew. And he said to that guide who was unsaved, he says, you know what the Bible says there in Psalm 118 in your, your Old Testament? He says, I do. And he says, you know, it says the stone which the builders refused. He says, would I be right in saying that, that the word stone, which is Eben, the word stone in Hebrew starts with a, a quiescent letter or a silent letter. He says, that's right. That's absolutely right. So I could pronounce that Hebrew word stone and leave that letter out. You could. And what would I be left with? Would it be the word son? He says, you're right, Ben. Son. So I could read that. The son which the builders and the Jews rejected. The same is become the head of the corner. And then he went further and he said, Which son did Israel reject? Did they reject Abraham, the father of the nation? Oh no, no, they didn't reject Abraham. Well, what about Moses, the meekest man in all the earth? No, they didn't reject Moses. What about David, Israel's greatest king? Oh, no, no, not David. And then he said these words. What about Jesus Christ? He claims to be the Son of God. And he says, yes, that's the Son. That's the stone we rejected. And then he went on to read, and I'm sure he quoted it in Hebrew as well, these words, verse 23. He saw verse 23, this, or sorry, verse 22, the stone which the builders rejected is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now. That's the word Hosanna. I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee. Send now prosperity. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, we have eulogized you out of the house of the Lord. And you can see then that it had to do with the work of Christ. Save now. Deliver now. In fact, send prosperity. 
is what the Old Testament says. Send spiritual deliverance and prosper the nation under the mercy and grace of God. And when you and I consider the work of Christ, what he accomplished on the cruel cross of Calvary, it certainly calls tonight for us to be grateful. We couldn't utter a petition tonight after hearing this message. We couldn't without first giving thanks to God. I want to say when we remember the sorrow and suffering, the pain and punishment, the terror and torments Christ underwent at the place called Calvary to save us from eternal hell and everlasting judgment, it certainly calls for songs of praise tonight. The hymn writer penned the words when I think of my blessed Redeemer. I think of him all the day long. I sing, for I cannot be silent. Why? For his love is the theme of my song. It's that little hymn I was going to quote to you. It is a common meter, uh, number 69, and we could sing it, no doubt. Come, let us join our cheerful songs with angels round the throne. Ten thousand thousands are their tongues, but all their joys are one. Worthy the Lamb that died, they cry, to be exalted thus. Worthy the Lamb, our lips reply, for he was slain for us. The whole creation join in one to bless the sacred name of him that sits upon the throne and to adore the Lamb. And we know that it has to do with the worthiness of Christ and it has to do with the work of Christ. Our tune is joyful. Do you know why? Because our theme is Jesus. So this praise had, we see the character of it. We see the content of their praise. There's one final thought here, and we can't pass it by. We see the criticism of their praise. Notice what it says in verse 39. It's a very interesting verse, verse 39 of Luke's Gospel, chapter 19. And it tells us there, And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, Rebuke thy disciples. Now there they were singing the Lord's praise. They were eulogizing him. They were quoting the Psalms. And they were all pointing toward Christ. And the Pharisees came to the Lord. And they said to the Lord, Master. That just means teacher. They weren't submissive to him. They recognized him as one of the rabbis. One of the teachers in Israel. Isn't that what Nicodemus says? We know that thou art come from God. Uh, thou art a teacher. Come from God, for no man can speak the way you speak unless he's of God. And we recognize the Sanhedrin, recognize that you're a teacher sent from God. That's why they called him, the, the enemies called him master. It was really saying, Rabbi, teacher, rebuke thy disciples. In other words, the word has a very strong meaning. Now, it doesn't just mean rebuke. It literally means forbid. That's what the actual word means. Forbid. And these Pharisees, the strength of the word they used on this occasion was, Master, forbid such praise. How can you take that which should really be given to God? How can you take that? They weren't really saying, stop these disciples praising, we don't like it. No, they didn't like the fact that they were saying things about Christ. And they were saying, Master, you, you need to stop this. Because they are saying you're God and you're the Messiah and you're the Savior and you are God veiled in human flesh who has come to save us from our sin. Now stop them. That's what they were saying. Stop them. More or less saying this is like blasphemy. And our law would command you be stoned to death for taking such praise. What did the Lord say? What did the Lord say to them? I'll tell you what he said. Look at verse 40. He said to them, he answered and said unto them, I tell you that, I tell you the truth. I want to tell you, even if I did forbid it, and I won't, because it's right and proper. Here's what he says. If they should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And I want to tell you something. That actually happened. That actually happened. You see, the disciples were not singing at the cross. They were silent. Most of them had fled when the shepherd was smitten. And they fled, and some had gathered round, sitting down with the multitude, watching their, him there. No one standing up, praising, singing. 
The daughters of Jerusalem were weeping and lamenting. And the disciples were afar off. Only John was seen at the cross standing alongside Mary. For Christ was able to identify him and speak to Mary and speak to John. But they were sitting down watching him. There was silence at the cross. And the Lord, when he was on the cross of Calvary, the Bible says uh, that the rocks began to call out because there was a great earthquake and the rocks literally were broken in two. And once that happened, immediately the multitude, not just the centurion, if you read your Bible very carefully in Matthew 27, I think it's verse 51, you read it carefully, it says this, not just the centurion, it says the multitude began to say with the centurion, truly, this man was the son of God. And so the rocks, they made a noise and the rocks began to praise. And they were viewing the rocks and looking at Christ at the same time and the rocks called for praise on that occasion. And the Lord said, if you forbid them, and they were, they were silenced at the cross. These stones, these stones, see the mountains that surround Jerusalem, these rocks, these stones, will sing forth my praise as the son of the living God. You know, it is true, the ungodly crowd, the ungodly crowd would forbid you praising the Lord. They would stop you on Saturday, witnessing and praising God at that supposed 60,000 strong sodomite parade in the city center, our capital in Belfast. They would stop you singing the praises of God I'd say an abortion clinic. They would stop you singing the praises of God in the developments and housing estates and town centers of our province. But I want to tell you something. Men hate Christ and they cannot stand any eulogizing of the Son of God. But let us not be put off because if we don't do it, the Lord will raise it up from somewhere else. And the Lord's not dependent on the free church and we thank the Lord for that. But he can raise up deliverance and praise from another source if we fail him. But thankfully, we are out and about. And we are singing our master's praise. Let's not be put off because the ungodly crowd would forbid us speaking his name and worshipping and praising and eulogizing Christ. But you know, unfortunate circumstances, not only the ungodly crowd, but unfortunate circumstances might even forbid such praise. In other words, things may not be pleasant in your life or mine. Things may not be good in your life or mine. But let us praise him through it all, no matter what's happening to us, because he's worthy of it. Like Job, who lost everything. When he lost everything, he got down on his knees And he said these words, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Unkind Christians would forbid such praise. It is true. Some who profess to know and love the Savior would be the first to throw a bucket of cold water over the fire of your love and devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and your Savior. But don't let them curb your enthusiasm. Don't let them dampen your spirit. And don't let them stop you living to the glory and praise of your Savior. As I finish, I want you to listen to me as I close. Saved from hell. Saved from hell. And shall we not praise him who saved us from hell? Sure of heaven. Sure of heaven, shall we not bless his holy name, sins forgiven? Shall we not praise and extol his holy name? Now, can we remain silent? No, we can't. We finish with the quoting of a hymn. I will praise him. I will praise him. Praise the Lamb for sinners slain. Give him all the glory. I've changed it. Tell abroad 
his story, for his blood hath washed away my stain. O oh, make his praise glorious. Amen. I believe the Lord will bless his word to all of our hearts. I don't return again to the prayer meeting, uh, God willing, until September, so it will be my last prayer meeting until September. Uh, 